That's what justice looks like to me, is, is a child being treated as God's own creation. We're Doug and Cheryl Kite, longtime members of Chapel Street, and a year ago we made a decision to begin serving in the ministry Safe Families for Children. This is an organization that, that comes alongside families in distress and offers to host children while the parents or parent navigates a crisis. Our little boy came from a home with a single mom, several kids. She'd been a victim of domestic violence. He'd seen things. That isn't right. It's not just. It's not the way God intends for a family unit to be. Our family is blessed. We love our children unconditionally. and. It would break my heart to think that there's a child out there that does not have that. Sometimes it can get overwhelming to think, how can I contribute? God brings you this opportunity to invest in a child you would never meet, ever. That child will be so blessed seeing your family, seeing God's love through your family. The Ministry of Safe Families is an instrument of God's justice in the world. It gives you as a volunteer an opportunity to treat children as God wants them treated. And God will work in your heart through the process to bring you to the place where you get great joy from it. I love Doug and Cheryl and their story and um, just the, the ministry of safe families. I love what Doug said. It's not just, it's not right. And what can you do with all these overwhelming needs and so many children in crisis? Well, you can make a difference for one through the ministry of safe families. In our series called And Justice for All, we're going to be telling you stories about Chapel Streeters who are working for God's vision of justice in whatever way they can in our community. Last week you saw the video of Ellie LeBron and the Love Your Neighbor Club, and this week hearing about safe families, and there's more to come. I just want to encourage you to pray for those ministries and perhaps pray and ask God where he might lead you to get involved in making a difference. So we're, we're so grateful for the kites and many families like them who are loving these children uh, in, in, in times of crisis. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord, we come to you now and ask you to speak to us through your word. We often get distracted and confused. We're looking out at our culture, and we need to be recentered on who you are. And so we ask you to do that now through the power of your divine and eternal word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, when my wife and I had a chance to travel to Zambia, Africa, uh, to visit some of our Serve the World partners there, Cure Hospitals and some of our mission partners, we had the chance to, one weekend while we were there, to uh, go to worship in a church in rural Zambia, way out in the bush, uh, with Harold and Na, his wife, uh, and there is their congregation. You'll see a picture here of us worshiping uh, out there at the Tubalenge congregation, way out in rural Zambia. These are the elders and their wives that you see us standing with, and Harold and Na next to us. When we were there, one of the things that struck me was on the way to church, and it was a long ride out into the bush, before church started, during church service, and after the service was over, all throughout that time, we were meeting people's needs, bringing food. We had a truckload of food, that we, a van load that we carried out there, feeding people that were hungry, meeting physical needs, finding out what needs people had and scheduling times to meet them throughout the week. The whole service was surrounded and filled with the meeting of physical, tangible needs. I learned something about worship that day that I don't think I ever quite grasped the same way in over 20 years of pastoral ministry in the suburban American context. It's something that is connected to our series on justice and our specific topic today, the interplay and the connection between worship and justice. Not two words we put together very often, but God does. Now last week we saw that justice is biblical, not political. It's highly politicized in our culture, but it's God's vision and God's idea that we're after. And we saw that justice means to make things right. And what is right and just is rooted in the character and nature of God, and that is revealed to us in his word. So that's the standard. He's the standard by which we align our ideas of justice, not the other way around. Because justice flows from the heart of God. Now, the passage we're going to examine today is one from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. 
He lived uh, and wrote and worked 700 years before Christ was born. This, his prophecies contain some of the most powerful messianic images in all the Bible. He wrote uh, some of the most familiar and powerful prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, Christ. Isaiah's name means Yahweh is salvation. And he wrote during the decline of Israel, when Israel, God's people as a nation, were falling into apostasy, idolatry, and corruption, and injustice during the time before the Assyrian conquest and the Babylonian captivity, but those things were coming. And though God's people were living unjust lives and corrupt lives, they still professed and claimed to worship him. The chapter we're going to look at is chapter 58. Now, I will give you a little Surgeon General's warning. It's pretty harsh. It's hard to read and to listen to. And rather than you watch me read it, I want you to hear the word of God read over you and to you. And as you listen, remember, though this was written 700 years before Christ was born, God is speaking to his people then and in a sense still today. Let's listen to the word of God read. Cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and that did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and to not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall, bring, shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your mix, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be as noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. It is a powerful passage, isn't it? It's staggering. These are strong words. How are we to understand them? How are we to make sense of them in our day? First thing I want you to see is that God confronts his people. He's confronting his people. Right away we see that there are, these are devout people. In verse 2, uh, we see that God, they're seeking God daily. They're seeking him every day. They want to know his ways. They're serious about their religious faith. They feel like God has let them down somehow. Because God's not answering their prayers. Uh, trouble has come to them as a nation. They're under threat. They feel oppressed. Uh, they feel like they're losing their identity, and they want to know, God, don't you see what's going on here in our nation? Don't you care? Aren't you going to do something? Why aren't you responding, God? That seems like a very relevant prayer for many people today. These people, God's people, are very invested in prayer prayer. 
fasting, Bible reading, religious services, and all the rest. But they're not, in the rest of their lives, their everyday activity, they're not living any differently from those who don't read the Bible, who don't pray, and who do not fast. And God has something to say to them. They're crying out, God, don't you see what's happening to our nation? And God's answer is, yes, I see. But there's something you don't see, and I'm going to tell you about it. Actually, Isaiah 58 is a parallel passage to uh, to chapter 1, where God speaks a very similar theme of, of confrontation and judgment on his people. Let's look at Isaiah 1, verses 12 through 15. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. I will not listen Your hands are full of blood. This is a staggering sentence. If we go back one slide, excuse me. If we go forward one slide. I will not listen. God says, I'm weary of your worship. I'm tired of it. It's a burden to me, and I'm not listening. This is shocking. This is God's people, Israel, he's speaking to. The chosen people. His people. And he's confronting them with really harsh words. God says he hates their religious festivals. He's weary of them. He's not listening to their prayers. I, it's easy for us to dismiss this as ancient and those people must have been very wicked and, and maybe it's not relevant for us today. Can you imagine hearing God say, I'm not listening? I don't, I, it would be undoing to me. Let's look at Isaiah 58 verses 4 and 5. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight. And you could replace the word fast here with the word worship. Because it's a way, it's a form of worship. And to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting or worship like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Same thing in chapter 1. Is such the fast or worship that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? You're kidding yourselves, he's saying. You cannot keep living this way, God is saying, and expect me to listen to you. Now, it does not mean that God doesn't actually hear our prayers. He's not responding to them as they want. He's not because their lives are unjust. Until they recognize their sin and deal with that, their prayers are, in effect, falling on deaf ears. But doesn't God see their devotion Yes, he does. They're seeking God daily. They want to know his ways. They're daily fasting and praying and offering sacrifices. But God also sees their living lives of injustice. This is the primary point of the whole passage, uh, that God connects worship with justice. We don't. When we hear the word worship, we think of singing, a worship service, a prayer service, something like that. Or when we hear the word justice, we think of the legal system, the judicial system, or perhaps we think of the culture's raging debates about what's involved with social justice. But we don't connect those two things, but God does. If you hear nothing else today, I hope you hear that. God connects worship and justice together. and We need to understand that. Worship, come to church, sing some songs, feel inspired. No. Not according to God. That's not what worship is. Not all of it anyway. This is really a persistent theme throughout the Bible. It's not just unique to the prophet Isaiah. Proverbs 21 verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. The Old Testament primary point of worship was prayer and sacrifice. What does God want more? How you live. Justice and righteousness. 1 John, the New Testament, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. I love that John addresses the church and us as little children. Little children, let's not just talk about it. 
Let's live it. James chapter 1, verse 27, James puts it in very plain terms. Religion that is pure and undefiled, meaning acceptable to God, before God the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. To live justly, in other words. Okay, back to Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 and 7 for a moment. Is not this the fast, and once again, the worship that I choose, that I desire, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. God says, do you want to connect with me? Remember their prayer. God, why aren't you responding to our prayers? Why aren't you listening to us? And God says, do you want to connect with me? I will tell you exactly how. We might be tempted to think, okay, okay, so God wants us to do more charitable stuff and then he'll listen to our prayers. It's more than that. It's much more than that. Let's look closely at these two verses, 6 and 7, because God is telling his people, and I believe us, exactly what he wants. He's being very specific. Uh, verse 6, we'll go back one slide. He says, we are to, the, the, what God desires is to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, and to break every yoke. So let's talk about the yoke. Um, you might have been with us a few weeks ago in our series on the Sabbath when we talked about the yoke as an image of following a rabbi, yoked to someone, going their direction. And Jesus took that metaphor and said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But a yoke was a, a burden. Uh, it was you were under the yoke, the weight, uh, and the obligation of something. And so in this context, the Old Testament metaphor here is it's a yoke of slavery or oppression or injustice. It's an instrument of injustice. Maybe it's a a corrupt practice in lending or or in business. Maybe it's an institution uh, or a system that's oppressing people or holding them down. But that's what the yoke refers to, an instrument of injustice. And God says, what I want from you is to undo the straps of the yoke so that the individual under that yoke can be set free. For example... A moment ago, we saw a video with Doug and Cheryl Kite talking about children under the yoke of broken families, a sin and, and, and brokenness in a family that through no fault of their own, children are under that burden, that yoke of injustice to rescue them, to give them a safe family for a time until that family can be healed and restore them to that. That's, so in other words, undo the straps and let those people free. But it also says to break every yoke. So we don't just stop by liberating an individual, we go further to undo those systems and those instruments of injustice. One of the best examples of this currently is a ministry called International Justice Mission, IJM. A couple of years ago, uh, their, their CEO, their president, Gary Haugen, came and preached to us a powerful message and told stories about how this ministry all around the globe is rescuing children and women out of sex trafficking, out of exploitation and child labor and slavery. But they're not just saving children in these horrible conditions. That's powerful enough. They're also working within the legal judicial system to tear down the systems that oppress children, that make it even possible to enslave them. So God says to his people thousands of years ago, you come before me with fasting and offering your sacrifices and saying you want to worship me, but you're ignoring people that are under heavy yokes. In fact, you're some of the ones putting the yokes on them. What I want from you is to undo those straps, is to break those yokes, tear down those systems in your own communities that are oppressing people, that are harming them and holding them back. And as Doug said in the video, how do we do this? It seems overwhelming. You can't change it all at once, but you can change it for one but you can work to change it for one. And then in verse 7, let's go forward. It says, And do not hide yourself from your own flesh. That's a powerful phrase. 
literally meaning you, of your flesh and blood, of your own family. What God is saying to us is the poor, the homeless, the vulnerable, the needy among you, you must see as if they were your own flesh and blood. They are to be more, as much of your family as your own flesh and blood. We, we tend to think of the poor and the needy and the vulnerable as people that we ought to care about. They're out there. But do you, ever, do you stop and think that that's a sister? That's a brother. That's a fellow child of God. That's an image bearer. And God's calling me to see them as if they were part of my family. You would not ignore your own family member in need. At least you, we shouldn't. If your brother or sister, father, mother, son, daughter, was hurting, was in need, was hungry, was homeless, was, you'd go to them. You'd do whatever you could to meet their needs. And God is saying, that's how I want you to view the poor among you, as your own family member. Now, let me just say, I know that poverty and injustice is a very complex and multifaceted issue in, in society, in a culture, in our, it's a reality in our world today. And our response needs to be nuanced and multifaceted. But if we're not personally invested, verse 10 we heard read a moment ago, it says, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, for the poor, it's, it's not standing at a distance saying somebody ought to do something or giving a little money toward that. It's pouring yourself out, personal investment. God's people, that's what he's asking. It can't be somebody else's problem, in other words. It can't be somebody else's de- issue to deal with. It must be ours. And this brings us to the third point. God calls his people to repentance. God confronts his people with their sin and their unjust lives and the injustice all around them that they're ignoring. God, then he connects worship and justice because they're saying, we're worshiping you, where are you? And God's saying, you're not because I see justice as worship. Then he calls them to repentance. Repentance is not a word we use very often uh, today. It's a word that sometimes uh, it sounds old and archaic and, and you know, outdated. But it's a powerful biblical word we need to understand. It means to turn around and head the other direction. To turn back specifically to God. The sin God confronts is that his people are engaged in meaningless worship because they are living unjust lives. And he calls them to stop, to change, and to return to him. Our cultural response to people who do or say something wrong is what? Cancel them. Shut them off. Uh, Get them canceled, get them boycotted, get them fired, like, you know, have nothing to do with them. Isn't it, isn't it good news that our God's response to people, us, when we live unjust lives, when we do and say wrong things, is not to cancel us, but to call us back to him, to call us to repentance, to trust him, to return to him. He does confront sin, but he calls us to confession and repentance. In, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we see it this way. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. And how would we learn to do good? Well, in his word. Seek justice. And remember, to seek justice is the same thing as to seek God. He is the person of justice. Correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. This is what God wants. This is what he's after. God calls us to repentance. Remember, in verse 2, God's people, Israel, they're daily seeking him. And he's telling them what it really looks like to seek him. Now, Isaiah 58 is is a powerful passage, but it's really Part one of part two, Isaiah 59. We won't have time to go into all of this. But chapter 59 is a continuation of chapter 58. And it really what chapter 59 does is gives us a broader picture of what an unjust culture looks like and how it got that way and how God intends to repair it. Isaiah 59 verses 9 through 12 is this. It's a prayer of lament and confession once God's people recognize that their worship is meaningless because of the injustice of their own hearts. And here's what they pray. And, and I want you to hear this uh, as a prayer that we could also pray as God's people today. Therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. Verse 
We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. Remember last week Jesus said, I came to proclaim recovering of sight to the blind. We're blinded by the sin of our own hearts. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there's none. This growling and moaning is describing the longing. It ought not to be this way. It ought to be different. This is not right. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. To come to the place where we could recognize that, that without God's standard, we're blind. And we long for things to be set right, but we don't even understand how that works apart from him. And we recognize that apart from him, we're part of the problem in the world. Justice is far from us. Why? Why is justice far from them? Because they are far from God. And who has moved? It's not God. It's their own hearts. That's really important and crucial for us to grasp. It's not, to say justice is far from us is not meaning God has moved away. It's mean they have moved away from him. And the result is there's no justice in the land. The inevitable result. Many in our culture today are crying out for justice, but they really don't know how to find it or what it even means because we're living in a society that has rejected a standard of, of ultimate objective truth. We want the fruit of justice without the root of God's truth. And you can't have the fruit without the root. It turns rotten. Let's look at Isaiah 59, verses 14 through 15. This is a powerful passage. Justice is turned back. What a phrase. And righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Go back one slide. Let's go back one. There you go. Justice is turned back. Why? Because truth has stumbled in the public squares. Truth is lacking. Do you see the connection between justice and truth? They have to go together. What happens when a culture, a society, a church, a people begin to lose their grip or reject outright God's standard of truth? Divine truth revealed to us in his word. Inevitably, it results in injustice. There is no justice because we're making it up as we go along. And even our desire to pursue justice only ends up in corruption and oppression and tyranny and more injustice. In chapter 9, 59, verse 3, God says, Your hands are defiled with blood because of this. And that's true in our culture, in our history, human history, not just that of our nation. They are. When we forsake God's truth, even our best efforts to bring about a just society end up in tyranny, oppression, and violence. I can't read that without personally thinking about 50 million unborn babies lost over the last 40, 35 to 40 years. Your hands are defiled with blood, he says. Our history of slavery in America, racial injustice. The list goes on and on and on. And it's not unique to America. It's, it's a human issue. That when we forsake God's truth, God's divine standard, there can be no justice. That's what we end up with. These were God's words through Isaiah to his people 700 years before Christ. Do you think this is relevant today? Do you think this has something to say to our culture, this current cultural moment today? Do you think it has something to say to the American evangelical church? To us as individuals? I do. Now, at this point, let me just stop and say, do you, do you feel guilty at all? Are you feeling a little bit beat down? Like, oh, I'm, I'm not. That's not the intent. That is not the point. Guilt will never produce a people of justice. Guilt will never bring about what God desires. Now, in our, in our secular culture, guilt is one of the primary motivators for justice work. But that's not what God's after, to make you feel awful about yourself and to labor out of guilt. It is not the motivation of the gospel. Love is. 
And this brings us to the last point. God casts a bigger vision. God casts a, a better vision, a more beautiful vision. For all the harsh words of judgment and condemnation, this passage is really a call to something better and more beautiful. This is what God com- is communicating to his people at the end of chapter 58. Let's read these powerful words again, verses 8 through 12. Then, I mean, and I'm going to underline some things here because I think it'll make the point for us. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. God's righteousness ahead of us and God's glory behind us, right? Surrounding us. Then shall you call and the Lord will answer. And you shall cry and he will say, here I am. Remember they were saying, God, why aren't you answering? He's telling him that he will. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. And you shall rise, raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called repairer of the breach, restorer of the streets to dwell in. What a picture of God's people. What if the watching world looked at God's people then and today and said, they're repairers. They are restorers. I don't know if I believe what they believe, but they are restoring things. It's undeniable. They're rescuing people. They're putting things back together. How are they doing that? What's causing that? God is saying, if you return to me, if you seek me, if you trust me, if you anchor yourself in my word, then these things will happen. Because he'll be doing them. So, did you see all the times it says then? We could ask the question, well, when? When will our light break forth like the dawn? Verse 7, when you feed the hungry. Well, when will you guide us, God, and cover us, God, and go before us and behind us, God? When you pour yourself out when you clothe the naked, when you feed the hungry, when you break the bonds of oppression, that's when. Then your righteousness will go before you. Then God will hear you and answer you. Now, it doesn't mean you you have to live perfect lives for God to hear you and answer you. What it means is we're kidding ourselves if we think we can come to worship once a week or twice a month or whatever it is or tune in online whenever it's convenient for us and, and live however we want ignoring God's law, ignoring the people around us who are hurting and think that God's okay with that. Think that we can just pray then and he's going to answer our desires and fit himself to our agenda. This is the God we're talking about. We conform to his agenda, not him to ours. And God is casting a vision here for what he wants and what he will do. Because you see, behind the biblical vision of justice, is something, it's, it's this rich, powerful, uh, nuanced understanding of something called shalom. We, we translate that peace, but it's so much more than the absence of conflict or peace of mind. It's the full flourishing of all of life. I want to read to you a quote, <clears throat> excuse me, from Neil Plantinga, who says this really, really well. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. A rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. Remember when we said justice is this sense of this is not right, it ought not to be this way. How should it be? Shalom is the answer. Shalom is what we long for, wholeness, flourishing, where children are safe and families are put together right and people are loving and serving each other and no one's ignoring or exploiting someone else. It feels like a far distant reality to many of us, but it's what God created the world for. It's what he desires. It's what he's going to do eventually and it's what he calls us to. So worship then. To worship God is to be working for the restoration of shalom. That's what justice is. The restoration of shalom, the pursuit of it, 
uh, an image comes to my mind. In, in Plantinga's quote here, he says, the webbing together of God and humans. When I first read that, I thought about the like sewing or, or knitting or fabric woven together. My wife loves to knit, and my daughter has picked up the, the talent and the interest as well. Um, and th- you'll see an image here of a sweater that my daughter knitted. Uh, she saw, I think, uh, I, won't, I, w- I don't know exactly uh, where she got the idea, but it's a pattern, and she made this sweater. Uh, and I wanted to bring it and wear it, but she thought perhaps that would be better if I just showed you a picture of it. <laughs> so anyway, my daughter knitted this, and it's, I think it's amazing and, and beautiful, and she's an artist and a crafts, craftswoman like my wife. But one of the things I want to mention is you, you can't, even though there's beautiful colors and there's different squares and patches, it's all woven together. You can't pull out one of those threads, the pieces of yarn, without ruining the whole. It's, connect, it's interconnected. When she was making it, she was putting these pieces together, but now they fit into this beautiful creation. That's essentially in which shalom, the way shalom works. We, we, shalom is not a, an individual pursuit. It's a communal project. We're working toward it together with God's help, by God's power. This is the worship God desires for his people to work, to restore the beautiful picture of what God intended. Now, this is really what's behind when we talk about the neighborhood church vision, that we want to be at Chapel Street Church a family of neighborhood churches, reproducing ourselves in neighborhoods and in communities. Why? To be a faithful presence of God's picture of shalom in that neighborhood that people would be, find the love of Christ, have lives restored, relationships reconciled, and find freedom and wholeness and flourishing in that community through the gospel. Finally, we know that we will not accomplish this in our own strength, and we will not accomplish this through any secular human institution. John Perkins, a famous uh, worker for civil rights and Uh, wrote a number of books, but the book that impacted me most deeply, he wrote, was called One Blood. I highly recommend it to you. And in this book, he's talking about there's really one race, the human race. We're of one blood. We're all image bearers of God. We need to see each other that way. And here's what he writes. We've been looking in all of the wrong places for help in fighting this battle for justice. We've sought help from social service agencies and government programs, but this is something that requires divine power. And he's absolutely right. It requires divine power, divine resources. Now, last week we talked about the gospel and justice. But here at the end of chapter 59 in Isaiah, there's this remarkably powerful picture of divine power in the Messiah, in the person of justice, Jesus. Let's read these verses from Isaiah 59, verses 16 through 17 and verse 20. He, God, saw there was no man and wondered there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld them. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. God robed himself, armed himself for battle, spiritual battle, to deliver, to save, to bring righteousness and justice in the world. How did he do that? And a redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And who is that redeemer? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the person of justice. So God says to his people, you you are missing it. You don't know me if you think you can worship on Sunday and ignore justice throughout the week. The way to worship me and seek me is to seek what I care about, to care about what moves my heart, hurting people. Then, when you do that, you'll be a picture to the world, shining as bright as noonday, restoration, flourishing, healing. Not because you're so great and you figured it out, but because you're trusting in me. And and the reason I love this, I wanted to end this way, and I love this, is because if we don't see that justice belongs to God, that ultimately he will right every wrong, that he and he alone will accomplish justice. If we don't have that security and that confidence, if we think it's all up to us, then every election matters ultimately. Then every policy change and every educational change, then, then everything hangs on what we can do through our human efforts. Well, no wonder people are so full of angst and divided and fearful and anxious. But if we have confidence that we serve the God of justice, 
And he doesn't call us to fix every problem on our own. He calls us to return to him. He's the God of justice. It flows from his heart. And our worship then is to seek what he cares about most. And it's justice, and it's mercy, and it's righteousness in the world. We have more to say, and I want to encourage you, tune in next week because Pastor John Kelly is going to be joining us. He's a dear friend and brother of mine, and I know that God is going to be speaking uh, through, to, through him to all of us. You won't want to miss that as you tune in next week as he speaks to us about justice uh, and, and Christ in the, and, in, the, in the New Testament book of Matthew. It'll be a powerful message. I hope you'll join us. Let's pray as we close. Father God, we thank and praise you for this ancient prophecy which contains so much relevant truth for us today. We confess to you that like your people long ago, sometimes we turn our back, we close our eyes, and we kid ourselves and think that we can come to worship on a weekend and live however we want throughout the week. We thank you that you do not cancel us in our sin, but you call us to repentance and draw us back to your own heart, that we might be, by your grace, people of justice, because we worship and serve you, Lord Jesus, our great God and King, the person of justice. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen.